The chair for this discussion will be Admiral Barry. He was a retired senior officer of the Royal Australian Navy. He was chief of the Defence Force for four years and served as commanding officer in HMAS Buccaneer and HMAS Stewart, amongst many other postings. He has held appointments as Defence Advisor New Delhi, India, Director of the Royal Australian Navy Surface Warfare School, Deputy Maritime Commander and Chief of Staff at Maritime Headquarters, Sydney. In addition to numerous other achievements, he was also awarded a Masters in Business Administration in 1996 by Deakin University. So welcome, and I invite you to commence the session. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here, and I can assure you, you're all anonymous to me due to the lights in the auditorium. Uh, I'm looking forward to this session, and uh, briefly, we've got a, a, a fantastic panel uh, with, I think, uh, a variety of views. So the keynote address will be given by uh, Peter Tesh. Uh, Peter served as uh, Australia's ambassador in Russia um, really for quite a long time, 2016 to 2019, and it was during his period of service there that I met him in Moscow in 2016. Uh, and I know uh, what an intellect he is. He also served as our ambassador in Germany from 2009 to 2013. So without any further ado, I'll invite Peter now to address us and give the keynote address for this session. Well, thank you very much, Admiral Barry. Chris, uh, welcome all. It's a pleasure to join you. Uh, I should say um, it's a particular pleasure as I've just clocked up three years in defence and despite the uh, prior experience in our foreign service, I am always conscious that defence was the first entity to offer me a grad position uh, when I was applying uh, in the latter stages of my university career, I ended up taking foreign affairs and don't regret it, but eventually made my way to defence, proving only that I'm a slow learner. But I am, uh, I am learning very rapidly. And the th challenge, I think, as we consider this particular subject, uh, I'm just struck by the issue about strategic horizons is one of the characteristics of those things is that they continually recede. Uh, but I think over the last few years, we have seen growing evidence that some elements on the horizon are looming ever larger and in fact are approaching rapidly. And I think the uh, strategic environment, as you would be well aware from the publication in July 2020 of the Defence Strategic Update, is now characterised by strategic competition of a scale and an intensity that I think we have not seen for decades. Military modernisation, all too rarely accompanied by transparency and clarity of intent and purpose. The growing resort to coercive statecraft, sometimes labelled grey zone activities, exploiting rules-based systems, exploiting sometimes those gaps where rules have not yet formed for the purpose of coercing others to the will of an actor, be it state or otherwise. Technological disruption, the pace and scale of technological modernisation and change, and of course, the pandemic and similar transnational challenges uh, are constantly forcing us to reconsider, reevaluate, and try to be as fit for purpose as we can in our policy frameworks. One of the problems we face now, I think, is that there is more Huntington than Fukuyama in our strategic environment. We are seeing ever sharper contours of an authoritarian versus more libertarian uh, social and political construct. We are seeing authoritarian states becoming more adept at instrumentalizing attributes of our societal, economic and political systems against us, attributes like transparency, accountability, plurality, contestability, uh, the diaspora, the independence of the courts. And I think what we are seeing increasingly with the, the immediacy of effect and impact, particularly in the public information domain, uh, is a greater potential for miscalculation, for misunderstanding, and therefore a growing risk of conflict. And hence, in July 2020, the government recast the defence strategic objectives uh, to effects-based shape the region in ways uh, that align with our interests, deter actions inimical to those interests and be ready and able to respond with credible military force when required, not just in relation to potential contingencies, but also, as we've seen, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, both regionally and in Australia. Importantly, we are backing ourselves with 
our resources. So this is rhetoric backed by resources, and that was evident in the four structure plan of 2020. So at the core, it's about strengthening existing partnerships. It's about building new relationships. It's about building both capacity and capability. And I had a very interesting conversation on this subject last night, the difference between capacity, platforms, kit, and capability possessing the ecosystem, the training frameworks, the entirety that is necessary to make that capacity efficacious in pursuit of government and national objectives. And it is about increasing presence, as those of you welcome visitors from the region will be very well aware. We need to modernise and increasingly be aware of how we operationalise alliances and partnerships. Uh, it is really important that we see these things for what they are, and it relates to a subject that will be discussed later, the commonality of purpose. This is not about alliances against, although I'm reminded of the Russian joke which says when you reach that level of intimacy, somebody says, let's be friends, and the response is, great, against whom? But that is not what this is about. We need also to use all the vectors that are available to us in building and strengthening and diversifying these relationships. That's exercises, it's the industry links, very amply illustrated here today, science and technology, and of course the people-to-people -people relationships that are so fundamental that I've been particularly struck by through that constant play of people going through staff colleges, building those networks of relationships. And so I think the thematic elements of this conference are extremely pertinent. The speed of relevance, technology and maritime operations, the grey zone and understanding the contest, and as General Campbell said shortly after the launch of the Defence Strategic Update in July 2020, to be able to operate in the grey, we have to learn to think in the grey, and that's a challenge. We need to be able to understand, even though our values and principles and interests may not lead us to apply those uh, approaches and instruments, we need to become better aware about what they are, how they are used, and where they pose challenge uh, for us. And finally, that commonality of purpose and the cooperation piece is vital. I want to briefly pass an observation. I was not here yesterday, but I'm sure Ukraine has arisen, and I've been very struck uh, by the number of commentators who seek to depict this as something Eurocentric, not relevant to the Indo-Pacific region, or even more self-servingly, you know, a Western, whatever that means, cabal locked in uh, conflict with, with Russia. It's actually far more than that, and it is far more fundamental and significant to this region. This is about a contest of systems, and it is about the accountability of those for undertakings that they have freely made. Uh, the Budapest Memorandum of 1994 had four nations committing inter alia, quote, to respect the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine. Further, undertaking, quote, an obligation to refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of Ukraine. That was signed by Presidents Clinton, Kuchma of Ukraine, Yeltsin, of Russia and by Prime Minister Major. And the letter transmitting that to the UN Security Council was signed by the permanent representatives, including Sergei Viktorovich Lavrov, now the Foreign Minister of Russia. So it matters because the abandonment of a solemn undertaking, the abandonment of the canon of rules and international law, uh, really lead to the inevitable conclusion that the argument is made that the resort to force, the imposition of the will of the stronger, over the less strong is a fundamentally acceptable approach to international relations. That matters to our region as much as it matters to the European continent. Importantly, I think we also need to recognise those themes, and I'll touch briefly on them, conscious that other speakers will have much more to say. Military modernisation, as I've mentioned, you know, the rapidity and the scale and the pace uh, is quite breathtaking. Uh, I don't need to quote numbers, least of all to a naval audience, about what we are seeing in our immediate region and more broadly across the globe in respect of naval tonnage and naval capability that is being developed and increasingly projected and deployed into our own regional waters and around the globe. The Indo-Pacific maritime domain is therefore becoming increasingly congested and contested. Technologies are being weaponised as sophisticated sensors, autonomous systems, big data analytical platforms and long-range high-speed weapons that deny access, 
reduce decision times and improve lethality. And of course that trend means the technological advantage that we have traditionally assumed and enjoyed is being narrowed, in some cases it's been eroded, in some cases I would contend it's been overtaken. And of course uh, we are seeing the growth in particular of China's Blue Water Navy, the expansion of its reach and its increasing presence and deployment activities as I've mentioned in our region and further afield. Emerging technologies are at the centre of geostrategic competition. They affect all aspects of international relations and foreign policy and they generate regional challenges that we need to be agile and poised to respond to, but more than respond, we need to be able to anticipate. Military modernisation, of course, is a critical element of military effectiveness, of interoperability and capability advantage. And in itself, there is nothing surprising or alarming about it. But transparency, purpose, doctrine is very important and we need to ensure that the collective uh, efforts are bent towards ensuring clarity around these things to prevent that misunderstanding and miscalculation that I referred to earlier. But we also have to be clear-eyed about the complexity and the challenges associated with the emergence of certain technologies. Uh, the reduction in deliberation and decision times, improvements to precision and lethality really underscore that we are going to see the ubiquity of new technology and increasingly wide scope for their asymmetric use. The changing character of warfare, of course, this is something uh, that you are all deeply versed and interested in. Increasingly, the integrated nature of war fighting, uh, of operations across the domains, whether it's the information and cyber domain, as we call it, we are seeing disinformation operations and foreign interference repeatedly and regularly, particularly also in Ukraine. Cyber as a vector for attack that brings the entirety of the polity and the economy and the society uh, into range. Economic coercion and economic punishment, frankly. And of course, we're seeing uh, the manipulation and the uh, disrespect of international law uh, particularly as it relates to the law of the sea that is generating particular uh, manifestations in the South China Sea and poses challenges to those freedoms of navigation uh, that are so vital to all of us. And debt trap diplomacy, you know, where investment becomes entrapment, uh, is another factor that in the strategic panoply of challenges, I think, uh, bears uh, close consideration. AUKUS is in part a response to these manifestations. It is a framework to align our national priorities, to amplify our collective strengths, and to accelerate the development and acquisition of advanced capabilities beyond the nuclear submarine program. It's a framework for deeper practical cooperation, and it comes as a supplement to, it does not supplant, the vital regional frameworks, partnerships and relationships in which Australia is and remains heavily invested, whether it is the Quad, whether it is ASEAN, whether it is the Pacific family, whether it is the five power defence arrangements or the Five Eyes, the trilateral and the increasing number of plurilateral arrangements that we have. Uh, AUKUS very much, in our view, complements that and it is further evidence of countries backing themselves, building capability and doing it in a transparent way for the purposes of ensuring uh, stability in our immediate region. So that cooperation and commonality of purpose, I think, is fundamental. Uh, it is very much what this conference is about, and it is really important, I think, that as we consider the strategic horizons, we are very focused on how we generate a focused force. That will be need, need to be considered alongside enhancements to cooperation with partners across the globe, so that we can best position Australia for the future. You know, we require sustained investment that has bipartisan support. We wish to build consensus, ensure with our partners strategic equilibrium in the Indo-Pacific. And we recognise that we are but part of a whole of government endeavour. Defence is an important part, but it is a part. Uh, and that is why we will continue to work assiduously and closely with our Foreign Affairs Service and with our partners in the region and beyond uh, as we confront the strategic horizons. Thank you, Peter. Please join me in thanking him for that keynote address.
<clears throat> so now we're going to move to the panel, and uh, today we have a, a stellar panel uh, to hear from, and each of the panellists has been asked to speak for about 10 minutes. The first panellist is Dr Ewan Graham, who is now working in Singapore with the SS community, uh, but has a stellar record of service in the Lowy Institute, La Trobe University and other places in and around Australia. Uh, he's going to be followed by Professor Samina Yasmin uh, from the University of Western Australia. Uh, she is a specialist in political and strategic development in South Asia and the role of Islam in world politics. Uh, following uh, her, we'll have uh, Rory Medcraft, who's a colleague from the Australian National University and head of our National Security College. Uh, Rory's been there since 2015 and I know he'll have some thought-provoking views uh, on the whole question of strategic um, horizons. Uh, he's got extensive experience both at Lowy and in government and security intelligence agencies. And then finishing off will be Dr Evan Laxmana, who is at the Centre for on Asia and Globalisation at the National University of Singapore. So I'm expecting this will lead to a whole host of different questions when we get to Q&A at the end. Can I ask uh, Ewan if you'd like to lead off? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the Sea Power Centre and the Royal Australian uh, Navy for the opportunity to um, be back in Sydney. It's, it's good to be here again. Um, I'm going to try and do three things which may be a little bit ambitious in the short time that I've got, but let's, let's give it a try. Um, all responding to this uh, concept of strategic horizons and how it relates ultimately to the maritime domain. But I want to start sort of big picture and perhaps a bit um, foolhardy of me to do so considering that I have the high pandrandrum of the Indo-Pacific um, just uh, a few feet to my uh, right in the form of Rory Medcalf. But, so Rory, um, put me back on track if I've got it wrong. Um, the Indo-Pacific is, is still being formed. I would contend that. It's an imagined space uh, to begin with. It's not naturally geographically defined, except for the main defining characteristic, which is the presumed confluence between two oceans. And it's fundamentally a maritime uh, concept uh, uh, into the bargain. Um, it's probably most controversial aspect is, is how it does or doesn't relate to, to Asia. Uh, I'd contend that it, it has to be uh, more than a purely offshore concept to be viable in terms of balancing, which I think is its underpinning uh, in strategic terms. And um, its limits are still being uh, determined uh, does it include, for example, all of the Indian Ocean region? Does it include all of Oceania? Some countries take the version that it does. Um, Australia, the US, and the UK, for that matter, have all adopted a more restricted definition of what is still a, lar a, a large macro region um, up to the dotted line that runs um, through uh, between the border between Pakistan and India and down the in Indian Ocean. Um, and all of that really is a, a preamble to, to asking the question, how far will the canvas, the strategic canvas of the Indo-Pacific uh, stretch? It is a, it's an idea, uh, uh, and I think that's an important thing to, to tie into the, the, the notion of strategic horizons exist really in, in the mind. Does it, as a sub-question to that, admit uh, a European uh, presence. Well, I'd, I'd contend that it does. Maybe in questions we can come to the, uh, the particular uh, role of the UK and, the, and France and other European countries if there's interest in the floor on that. Second point, which is um, a bit of a non sequitur, but thinking back that it's, this is the first time we've reconvened since uh, the pandemic, uh, I think the effect of, of COVID on state behaviour and on the conception of strategic horizons uh, is an, an important fact we need to consider. And I think the common denominator there is um, a tendency towards increased isolation and restricted human um, interaction. That doesn't mean that connectivity has stopped. In fact, um, rather uh, counterintuitively, trade it has boomed to the point that it's actually stretched supply chains to the, the limit. But the effect on on how we interact as human beings, I think, has been uh, 
uh, very significant. And while that quarantine approach or quarantine mentality may be successful in terms of health policy, it comes at a, at a cost, at a cost for foreign policy and, uh, and um, a strategic view of the world. Given that the cure has had pronounced effects on psychology at the individual level, and I'd say that that um, trends up to, the, uh, to having national level effects as well. Uh, COVID, it's often said, tends to find the weak spot in, in societies. I think there's a lot, a lot to that. Uh, it's not the primary driver, but it tends to accentuate and uh, intensify trends that are already present. And we're looking out into our region, we see now at the tail end of a long pandemic um, where uh, China, for example, is now in a, a particularly intense phase of, uh, of, um, of, of quarantine to the extent there is um, now minimal interaction for, for many ordinary Chinese, whereas just a few years ago, uh, there was um, far more freedom of, of movement. That is going to have a significant effect. Um, Japan too, although Japan is um, far more present, I think, in, in diplomatic terms as reflected in this, um, this uh, uh, conference. Um, but there is also, I think, a, a tendency to, to, uh, to look, look inward. And even here in Australia, I, I should say that, um, although I've spent a long time in Australia, I've been based in Singapore, so I'm looking at it from the outside. But who would have imagined uh, that for such a long period, Australia's borders uh, would, be, would be closed and that uh, the weak spot would be found um, uh, rather uh, surprisingly in, in, in the form of the Federation, where internal borders that had, were not intended to serve as physical borders became so between, between states. That all comes at, 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 a, at a cost. And I think the baseline effect is, is this tendency towards national introvertedness. That is the big factor that impedes a, uh, a, a, a broadening and raising of, of strategic horizons, which is necessary in the context which Peter Tesh has just outlined of intensifying geopolitical uh, rivalry. Um, that introvertedness may not have pronounced effects on international behavior, but in extreme cases, it has. And I think Russia may be one such case. I'm not saying that that's the primary driver that Russia invaded uh, Ukraine uh, because of COVID. That would be absurd. But I think it nonetheless may have accentuated. Uh, and that's an unanswerable fact, at least in, as far as it can only be answered within um, Vlad Vladimir Putin's mind. But I think some of the uh, collateral evidence that we've seen Yes, that the mentality may have been uh, stretched and allowing a more pronounced nationalism to, to take a hold. So this isolation is something that creates headwinds, uh, even for uh, op open societies uh, such, as, such as Australia's. Um, Ukraine was mentioned uh, in Peter's comments just now. I, I also picked up on the fact that it was mentioned by Admiral Sakai yesterday and Admiral Noonan for that, for that matter. And I think... Um, it is having, I, I would agree with Peter, it's not something to be seen as something over there. It is having a pronounced effect as a stimulus to raising strategic horizons. And I think it will be seen as a very important threshold uh, that changes uh, poli um, politics at the global uh, level. And in this region, the biggest unknown will be what's the war, the influence of the war uh, on, on China's thinking, um, to be uh, direct and, and frank about it. Uh, we don't know that. It's too early to tell. But what we can say, as a result of China's uh, overt and, and recent uh, embrace of a security role in the South Pacific, uh, is that Beijing uh, does continue to expand its strategic horizons further into the region. I think that is uh, not a contention. I think that is now increasingly a hard point of evidence. Um, Finally, to relate this to the uh, maritime domain, what's the impact on, on navies? Well, as I said, as a general level, it creates uh, headwind, headwinds against um, uh, interaction at an individual level, at an institutional level. Navies were heavily affected at the beginning uh, of the pandemic uh, in the form of infections uh, and also uh, all of the uh, uh, operational obstacles that flow from contactless uh, port visits and the like. Uh, but for all that, from my vantage point in Singapore, which of course is a perfect place to, to look at uh, maritime interaction uh, in the Indo-Pacific because it sits right at the center of, 
of that hinge between the two oceans. Uh, and uh, what was very striking to me was that the, in, in the hardest um, part of the pandemic, just what a, uh, a, a, um, a, a significant naval presence uh, there was on the part of um, the US, Australia, Japan, uh, India, and the European uh, countries that all, uh, for their different reasons, uh, but with a commonality of purpose, uh, I think, uh, to uh, maintain that presence. And that, that is matters, I think, because navies I, I see as the embodiment of national will at, at one level, but also the extension, extension of the societies uh, that, uh, that, that invest and, and, uh, and crew them, ultimately. Um, and I think that that is uh, um, in a, maybe a, a, a pleasing contradiction that in the middle of uh, a, a pandemic that imposed isolation uh, at a national level, uh, that navies were able to maintain that level of, um, of uh, extroversion uh, and, uh, and, and, to, and presence uh, in the region. At one point, I think Australia had no fewer than seven ships out in the, in the region in, in 2021. So I'll, um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Ewan. And now, uh, really to um, shake our imagination, I hope, uh, Professor Samina Yasmin. Thank you very much, uh, and I'm very grateful to the organizers for including me. Uh, I'm not very good at uh, technology, but let me see if the uh, PowerPoint that I had come up with is present. Obviously, I pressed the button earlier, but let me uh, give you a brief idea of what I want to talk about. My discussion is more focused on South Asia and the Middle East, with reference first to the role of religion. And then after that, the continued trends in terms of geopolitical relations in the region or the regions. And then I want to ask as to what does that mean for the future for us, which I think needs to be taken into account both by the Navy but also by other interested uh, policymakers. So first of all, religion and politics in the region that I've defined as my main area of interest at the moment. Uh, I think it's no sort of hidden message in it, but the reality is that not just simply 9-11, but before that, religion had become a very important factor in world politics and in the regional politics, but it wasn't acknowledged as such. The reality is that with the Afghanistan uh, invasion by the Soviet Union and American use of Pakistan to push the Soviets back really brought religion into the mainstream of international politics with Mujahideen. And once the Soviets were rolled back, the Pakistan government that had provided its uh, territory for this purpose actually used religion to garner support within uh, the political streams, but also to use groups that had been trained during the Afghan Jihad to cross the border and go into India. So the use of religion for warfare was already in South Asia before 9-11. Um, the rise of Taliban in the 1990s was part of that process. But effectively what we see is that 9-11 brought to the attention the fact that there were groups and countries that were willing to use religion for political purposes. Uh, it's not just simply 9-11 where the use of religion stopped. In fact, the rise of Islamic State also brought to notice the fact that religious groups using different interpretations can occupy areas and then they can pose threat to security on ground but also uh, in, in oceans. What I do want to point out is that even though the focus on study of religion in world politics and in the region has restricted itself to Islam, the reality is that instrumentalization of religion or the use of religion for political purposes is not limited to Muslim countries. In fact, when we look at how India, a very significant country in the region with a huge history of secular trends, has also started moving into the use of religion to build a sense of identity, but also letting groups that use religion for uh, purposes that impact on social cohesion it gives us an understanding that religion is not just simply being used by Muslim countries, but also by others. 
I'll very quickly go to the fact that religion is also not simply across religious barriers, but it's also being used in sectarian conflicts. And so the reference to Velayat e Faqih, an idea which has governed the rule of Islamic Republic of Iran since 1979, and Wahhabism followed by the Saudi Arabian government, is a very clear indication of how religion has really been used by these countries to build their a presence and build their influence. Now, it's not just simply the religion which I think we need to think about because we also need to think about how geopolitical trends and conflicts have continued in which countries have viewed each other as being the other. In case of Middle East, and I'll go through it very quickly, the fact that China, uh, the Soviet, uh, sorry, Saudi Arabians identify themselves as Wahhabis and the Iranian government identifies itself mostly as the Shia uh, follower of the religion, basically has created this uh, struggle between them to create influence areas within the Gulf, but also beyond that. In case of uh, Iran, it has created a whole arc of influence, which includes uh, Iraq, Syria, we would argue even Lebanon, and to some, some extent even Hamas. And the Saudi Arabian government has responded to that first by establishing what it refers to as the Islamic Military Alliance, which is basically based on a lot of uh, Sunni Muslim countries. But it's gone beyond that in order to counter what it sees as the Iranian effort to include uh, different countries into areas of influence. It's actually also extended its friendship hands to Israel, which in, until very recently was not really approved of or looked favorably by a lot of regional countries. Interestingly now, there's not just simply United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, uh, that has accepted uh, Israel into this body of uh, international community and established diplomatic relations with them. Saudi Arabia has also at least provided their airspace for the flights to come from Israel into United Arab Emirates. Now, what does that show us? I think if I was to look at it and say, the situation on the ground has changed in a way in which sectarian conflict has created push for relationships that until very recently we could not even think of. It tells us that there can be things that can happen that are very unexpected. What about in South Asia? And again, I think in South Asia, one of the relationships that has been continuous has been the animosity between India and Pakistan. There have been different periods in which we think about them improving relationships, but the reality is that after sort of few steps forward, they go back in the as before. They keep on struggling in terms of arms acquisition, in terms of their nuclear status, and also trying to present the other in negative light. But what's more concerning, I think, is the global balancing that has been developing in South Asia in which Americans and the Indians have established an alliance which has been countered by, or some would argue that in fact it's been initiated by China and Pakistan together, which also has colors of geoeconomic uh, indications. Now, what does that really mean? I think what we're seeing is the geopolitical trends, which until very recently were elsewhere, have really come into South Asia and the Middle East, and they moving things in the directions that, as I said, were unthinkable at the start of the new millennium. Now, what does that mean for the region and how do we see the future? Uh, very briefly, what I would say is that the role of religion, which until very recently was not recognized, is something we need to start thinking about. It doesn't have to create fear, but I think it does require understanding of why people use religion for certain purposes and how that can be instrumentalized by different governments or different regional groupings. Uh, that also suggests that because Taliban government have come back to power in Afghanistan, uh, with Islamic State Khorasan operating in eastern Afghanistan, with Pakistan government using religion for political purposes, and also, as I said, the signs of that in uh, India, we would see greater use of religion. Uh, in case of the Muslim space, I think militancy or jihadi language would not disappear. And its impact on the region is that we would see probably increased movement of people from within the states, but also 
trying to seek uh, asylum as had been the case uh, in the early uh, 2000s. What about the geopolitics? I think India-Pakistan relations are continuing to be negative as they were before. But what I do want to point out is that we need to start thinking about this global balancing that has been happening in South Asia with US-India uh, relationship on the one hand and China-Pakistan on the other. Any assessment of that relationship really is based on the assumption that things would continue to be the way they are. And I'm glad our other speakers have talked about it before. But I think we need to understand that the way the Chinese economy is moving, uh, the way their population makeup is shifting, is going to have an impact on Chinese strength. And so that may change the direction of China-Pakistan relationship. Even in case of India, uh, although we have this very positive image of India, and it has been improving a lot compared to where it was, say, is 70s and 80s, there is uh, some evidence which suggests that Indian policies may not uh, continue in the economically positive direction. So what does that mean? I think we need to be prepared for that, and not to say that somehow India would suddenly crumble inside, but I think the policymakers in India and in the United States need to be thinking, as well as Australia, as to how do we deal with it if there is another backward slide in Indian economy. Finally, in the last 30 seconds, what I do want to point out is, again, as Peter Tesh said, that Ukraine is not somewhere out there. Something that I haven't really mentioned is that how South Asia and the Middle East have been moving in the more recent past has been quite a good experience. But when we look at what's happened in Ukraine, the wheat basket for the world, uh, the reality is that it's going to have an impact on food security in this region. Uh, until so far, the Food Security Index has shown us that most of the countries in the region have been quite okay, with only Yemen and Afghanistan being very low in the index. But the fact that now these oil prices have increased and also because the availability of wheat may not be guaranteed, we're likely to see more food insecurity in the region. And again, that would set in motion another uh, sort of trend which could require people to move out of their areas of uh, inhabiting and they may want to move out of their borders and that would set in motion a whole other set of uh, problems which I think Navy and other policymakers would have to face. So to cap, I guess what I really want to say is that if you want to look at the region, if you want to look at the strategic horizons, I do think about the religion, do think about how it intersects with geopolitical considerations, and think about the ordinary people who may or may not have enough food, and therefore may start thinking of moving elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Samini Yasmin. Uh, there was quite a number of questions I wrote to myself, having heard that presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, next off, a cab off the rank is uh, Professor Rory Medcar from the Australian National University. Rory. Thanks very much for that, uh, Chris, and uh, great to be here. Uh, and I'm, I'm really, I think, appreciative of the, uh, the context that um, uh, Samina has just set with uh, reminding us of the, the human dimension, the human factor, that this is ultimately about the security of societies as well as, as, well as of nations. Uh, before I get into a few substantial remarks about Indo-Pacific strategic horizons and how I see them. I'd also note that um, the work of the Royal Australian Navy uh, through this series of conferences over many years and um, under, under the leadership of uh, Admiral Noonan in recent years has actually been quite instrumental in helping to drive and frame a lot of the thinking uh, that I'm going to talk about here today. I think both for Australian and indeed all for our international visitors from, uh, from navies and maritime forces uh, around the Indo-Pacific and around the world, your job is hard because you're the practitioners. Uh, our job is to illuminate the complexity and the uncertainty that you have to navigate. Um, so please take all of this with that, um, with that caveat in, in mind. So when we think about strategic horizons, I think we have to think about horizons of opportunity as well as horizons of risk. And it's very easy at the moment for us to focus overwhelmingly on the risk side of the ledger uh, for all of our countries as we look at um, risks and challenges out there. But do think 
about the opportunities, especially for partnership, that a broader conception of the regional uh, security landscape offers. And I think that's one of the great um, benefits of the Indo-Pacific idea. Now, uh, my colleague uh, Ewan Graham is absolutely right in saying that the Indo-Pacific is a contested concept. It's contested uh, in the sense that different countries have, uh, are adjusting somewhat different definitions. There's plenty of academic uh, and commentary at noise uh, and analysis um, around that, and that's very, very healthy. It, it, it's a work in progress. I think what you need to think about is whether it's useful <coughs> to you or not, and how you can make it useful to you as, um, as security practitioners. Because when you think about it, uh, every country has its own variant of Indo-Pacific horizons, including, I should add, China. I mean, ironically, <coughs> the country that is perhaps uh, most openly uncomfortable with the term Indo-Pacific has uh, a maritime Silk Road um, strategy, part of its overall Belt and Road Initiative, which is almost the most Indo-Pacific strategic concept um, imaginable. It's the Indo-Pacific with Chinese characteristics. So I think uh, don't listen to what China says. Watch what it watch what it does. Is my is my strong advice. So, what in my view is the Indo-Pacific, and how does it frame the uh, the policy choices, the uh, the strategic policy choices we all make? As I've argued in uh, my book on the subject, and I've been, I guess, proselytising uh, variants of the Indo-Pacific at conferences like this for a number of years, in the end, it's, it's useful as a, a mental map, as a conception of the region that helps, helps to frame policy, and it points to uh, a growing sense of there being a system, if you like, across uh, this two ocean region. So think of the Indo-Pacific as, uh, to some degree, uh, a system, uh, and certainly argue uh, among and within yourselves as to whether it shows the properties of a system or not, whether one uh, element or one force in the Indo-Pacific responds to another. Think about the Indo-Pacific as well as uh, really very much an, an expansive two ocean uh, framing of the region, uh, not only the Pacific and the Indian Oceans, but certainly uh, the, uh, the connecting waters, uh, the role particular of uh, the, uh, the seas and the, and the, and the sea lanes uh, around Indonesia, uh, and, and indeed the role of Australia as well. Think of the Indo-Pacific as a diplomatic platform, and what's fascinating for me is the way in which variants of the Indo-Pacific have become policy uh, not only in Australia in recent years, and India and Japan and the United States, the Quad members, um, all separately uh, developing their Indo-Pacific ideas, but also among friends uh, across the region uh, in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, playing a lead role in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, uh, the fact that European partners uh, are forming their own Indo-Pacific uh, visions. And even, uh, I'd note, uh, as far afield now as, um, as Canada, New Zealand, Britain, Taiwan, uh, and I'd say in months to come, the Republic of Korea, different variations of thinking about how a two ocean system is a useful framework for policy. Um, going to that question of uh, the usefulness and the limitations of those, of those horizons, uh, personally, I think it's good to focus on the idea of connectivity uh, the fact that the Indo-Pacific privileges the idea of connectivity across a maritime space uh, is an advantage it has over other regional conceptions. I don't disagree uh, when Ewan notes that we can't rule out the land, um, perhaps a controversial point to make in this room, but I think the Indo-Pacific idea is most powerful when we think about its connection to continental definitions of the region, and that's why port infrastructure and other infrastructure really at the, um, at, at the land sea boundary is, is and as, as China knows, is some of the most vital uh, connective infrastructure of the region, kind of strategic commanding, commanding heights. So the, the Indo-Pacific is useful where it connects with the land and in many ways uh, the, the two, Indo-Pacific and Eurasia, are interactive. Um, so, going briefly now to a few of the dynamics to think about as we look at these strategic horizons and how they can inform policy making, uh, Peter Tesh has uh, articulated uh, not only an Australian policy view, but I think quite a rich analytical framework for thinking about strategic competition in the region and how I fear that what we're dealing with now is more than competition. Uh, I've argued that we should think of a spectrum of 
state behaviour and interaction across the Indo-Pacific with cooperation at one end, uh, the, the happy uh, nirvana that we're all looking to, um, and conflict at the other. And we're somewhere in the middle, but I don't think we're in a state of pure strategic competition anymore. I think it's somewhat worse than that. Um, and in fact, if you think that what comes after con uh, competition is confrontation, and what comes after confrontation is conflict, uh, I fear that in many dimensions of the strategic dynamic, particularly between China and a whole range of other countries, not only uh, the United States or indeed Australia, we're somewhere between competition and confrontation. That's obviously not healthy and a realistic state for us to aim for in the short to medium term is competitive coexistence, which actually is the concept that the Biden, articula uh, Biden administration has articulated in its uh, Indo-Pacific vision. Uh, and I think that's a really important idea to develop. How can we make uh, a, comp a state of competition sustainable without leading to conflict and building enough confidence in our interactions with potentially hostile powers uh, that we can move in time away from confrontation uh, and avoid conflict. And I guess a couple of points to, to end on there. Uh, I guess uh, some principles, if you like, for competitive coexistence in, the, uh, in this Indo-Pacific era. So uh, I identify five, I guess, categories, or uh, if, you, if you want to be uh, impolite about it, buzzwords, um, that I think are useful markers for policy here. Uh, and you've heard, you've heard most of this before. Uh, but I think the five principles of peaceful, competitive coexistence for the Indo-Pacific uh, are resilience. In other words, we begin with building our own national capability uh, to such a point that we can resist coercion and we can bounce back from shocks. Uh, and I would incidentally put the, um, uh, the AUKUS technology sharing arrangement that Australia is pursuing um, partly within that category. Solidarity, in other words, uh, identifying as much common cause and like-mindedness as we can. That does not have to be purely a kind of set of values-based alliances. Uh, you know, we have to acknowledge the political differences among many countries and the way they interpret, for example, uh, democracy. Uh, but solidarity in respect for principles of a rules-based order and principles of sovereignty. I think that's a reasonable, a reasonable starting point. Deterrence, uh, and again, looking at deterrence uh, in an overwhelmingly defensive mindset uh, and deterrence that is not purely about unilateral deterrence, but about shared arrangements to discourage um, adventurism and instability in the region. And again, I'd put uh, Australia's uh, partnerships, whether it's, um, whether it's the AUKUS technology arrangement, whether it's the alliance with the United States, which remains, uh, I think, the overarching um, security alignment for Australia in the region, uh, I'd put those in the deterrence basket. Uh, development, and we're seeing at the moment in the, the contest for influence in countries like Solomon Islands uh, or elsewhere across the region, uh, the absolute importance of privileging the interests and rights of, of nations as they develop their societies and their infrastructure, that's a priority, if you like, that, cut, that should come first uh, before we, we privilege the strategic competition. In the end, the game, and I don't like to use that term, but the contest for influence that all our nations are in is only going to work if we manage military and other security power in tandem with uh, meeting the development needs of the region. And finally, diplomacy. And that's not because diplomacy comes last. I think diplomacy really overshadows everything that I've said. Uh, and diplomacy is, of course, a uh, much more affordable investment uh, than a lot of what, um, what we do in the, in the military space. So I just throw those there as a few guidelines for policy. As I wrap up, I just note that um, there should continue to be healthy debate about what is the Indo-Pacific, how can it be useful for policy, uh, at what point do we need to adjust our regional horizons. Again, how do we navigate the gap between rhetoric and reality? in what our, our uh, policy positions are and our governments do and say, and whether we should take to heart the idea of continuing to sometimes do more and say less about these issues. How do we navigate the uh, differences between uh, an inclusive and an exclusive vision of the region? And I would argue uh, that Australia is working very hard to navigate, to navigate that space. 
And what do we do when strategic shocks continue to upset the regional order uh, and the global order? And I like the references to Ukraine in this conversation. I think we have to think Indo-Pacific along with sub-regional dynamics and ultimately the global strategic balance. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rory. Uh, and our last speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Evan Lakshama, Lakshmana from the University of Singapore. Uh, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, first, let me say thank you uh, to the Sea Power Center and the Royal Australian Navy uh, for having me uh, this morning. Uh, so in terms of strategic horizons, I'll be speaking mostly from the viewpoint of Southeast Asian countries. And my argument is that the strategic horizon of many in Southeast Asia will still be dominated by the U.S.-China strategic competition. Uh, but that actually means that Southeast Asian countries will be more concerned, not less, with strategic autonomy as we move forward. And one part of that equation of the concern about strategic autonomy is the likelihood of Southeast Asian countries thinking, developing, and implementing various capabilities which we would uh, classify as, as anti-access or area denial. And I'll explain uh, in three ways why I think uh, Southeast Asia needs and are thinking about um, these A to AD uh, capabilities. Uh, first, in terms of the US-China uh, competition itself for Southeast Asia, I think there's two key strategic concerns for Southeast Asia. One is sort of more on the regional side of things. I think uh, privately many Southeast Asian uh, policymakers are wondering whether or not uh, the existing institutions led by ASEAN is sufficient uh, to tamper down the effects of the US-China uh, strategic competition. And I think there's a lot of skepticism in the room uh, whether that's the case. Uh, uh, secondly, of course, th uh, they are concerned with domestic polarization caused by the US-China uh, strategic competition. Now, with the issue of both domestic uh, as well as regional uh, strategic environment, uh, whether or not uh, the US-China competition leads to some form of intervention or intrusion into the maritime uh, airspace as well as land um, uh, domains is, is certainly a key issue, which is why I think uh, Southeast Asian countries more and more are trying to find ways to develop an effective uh, policy to boost up its strategic autonomy. Now, what do I mean by strategic autonomy? It's basically the ability of Southeast Asian countries themselves to define and defend their strategic interests free from external influence and interference. And our military capability, I think, is only one part of that equation. Now, uh, moving to the anti-access part, which is, I think, uh, one of the key reasons why uh, they're thinking about uh, strategic autonomy, a couple of misconceptions is that somehow A2AD is inherent to China. It is not. That somehow A2AD is about technology alone. It is not. Uh, and if you look at the broader literature, as well as the, um, uh, the practices of various uh, states around the region uh, throughout history, <clears throat> I think we can think of uh, a more broader uh, metric, if you will, of, of anti-access and area denial from the grand strategic level to the institutional level operational, and then uh, technological. And if you look at these broad metrics uh, of anti-access, and when you try to, to sort of think about how they might apply to Southeast Asian states, you kind of see a spectrum of where Southeast Asian states are in terms of their ability uh, to implement and develop A to AD uh, capabilities from sort of the more uh, or most, most uh, developed and most ready to the least. Now, most Southeast Asian countries are not going to be explicit uh, in its public documents or statements about adopting some form of A2AD, but if you read the undertones of their doctrinal development, operational concepts, strategic concerns, as well as some recent trends uh, in military procurement, you will detect some uh, bits and pieces of anti-access intent, at least, um, and considerations. So if you look at the spectrum, I think Singapore and Vietnam is probably the more uh, ready and most developed in terms of both tech concepts and institutions, as well as operational uh, proficiency compared sort of the ones in the middle, like Indonesia and the Philippines, who are probably more right now at the concept speculation stage uh, with some uh, uh, recent uh, piecemeal procurement in that direction. And then at the end of the spectrum, sort of Thailand, Myanmar, 
um, Laos and, and Brunei who are sort of thinking about it from a, a, a broader uh, historical concerns, but less in terms of strategic concerns for a specific A to AD um, outlook. Now, what does this mean, I think, in terms of what's next for Southeast Asia who are thinking about uh, these kinds of capabilities, about concerns over great power politics? I think there's three major implications for the region. First, uh, given that the at the heart of Southeast Asia's concern isn't about uh, choosing side, it isn't about bandwagoning with one country over another, uh, I think the U.S. as well as uh, its allies and partners should support rather than uh, block uh, the intent um, and plans for Southeast Asian countries to develop anti-access capabilities. Now, of course, when it comes to anti-access uh, for Southeast Asian countries, uh, this is basically a strategic wager by uh, U.S. and its security um, uh, partners and allies in the region. Why is it a wager? Because the idea of anti-access has to be inherently tied with domestic resilience against external influence. Now, we cannot develop uh, a one-season resilience against one actor only, let's say China. When we develop resilience, it has to be an all-weather resilience. So that means if we are capable to resist Chinese influence, we should also be uh, able to resist American or even Australian influence as well. So it is a wager that that capability may not just be used against China, uh, but as well as against uh, the U.S. and other uh, security partners around the region. But if done properly and if done well, uh, and that if the anti-access capabilities are strategically sound, it does also provide an added deterrence value, not the kind of deterrence that uh, we might be uh, looking for, but at least in terms of uh, uh, complicating uh, those policymakers uh, thinking about a regional conflict in the region. If we cannot take for granted that Indonesian waterways and airspace are open, uh, to uh, combatants during a regional conflict, that should make it harder uh, for all countries in the region to contemplate a regional war. So it is, I think, a strategic wager in that sense. But if done well, it not only provides uh, deterrence value, but also uh, boosts the ability of, of regional countries to contribute to regional security. Now, of course, another part of that wager is what happens if you're using the anti-access capability not just during wartime, which requires a different set of judgment, versus peacetime. Will you block uh, freedom of navigation, for example, and so forth? That, I think, is a debate worth having. Um, but without the a proper sound framework for uh, anti-access capabilities, that is still a long a conversation away. A second implication uh, for regional armed forces is the need to move away from an, an army-centric defense planning and put more emphasis on the navies and the air force. Now, this is a bit difficult uh, because around the region, the armies tend to be the more dominant service uh, for historical reasons as well as strategic reasons. And it's certainly the case now after Ukraine that some of the lessons taken from the war in Ukraine is the need to actually re uh, revive older conceptions of territorial defense, of the growing domestic role of the army in preparing for such an eventuality. So I think this is a bit counterintuitive uh, for many regional uh, defense establishments right now to contemplate uh, a Navy and Air Force uh, driven anti-access uh, capabilities. And lastly, of course, uh, with anti-access uh, capabilities for Southeast Asia, uh, this is a long-term project. It's not something that can be done overnight. It's certainly not just about off-the-shelf uh, procurement of technological uh, capabilities. And I think this is why uh, this fits with uh, uh, my earlier point of long-term strategic horizons for Southeast Asia, which is to contemplate uh, the processes and the policies uh, that we can uh, sort of think on terms of how to boost strategic autonomy as we prepare uh, for the growing strategic polarization, um, the growing strategic polarization caused by the U.S.-China uh, competition. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Evan. And uh, we've now got some time, nearly uh, 25 minutes, for questions from the audience. But before we begin, I've got one question I'd like to ask uh, Peter Tesh. Uh, and it concerns the Navy's uh, prospective programs to build capabilities in Australia. And my question for Peter is, what are the 
short and medium term things that we might need to change in Australian industry to support the Navy's plans? Uh, the easy question. Um, mindful, of course, uh, that this is something which is getting a lot of airplay in the course of uh, the election campaign, I'll be careful in responding because you know, the government's position is very clear on this. But I mean, fundamentally, I don't think it surprises anybody that, uh, and I'm sure you've heard from Jonathan Mead uh, about the need to develop, I think, in my view, a very, very different uh, whole of life view of what it takes to develop the industrial capability in this country, not just to support uh, nuclear powered submarines, but to shift to realise what self-reliance means. You'll recall in the strategic update in the four structure plan, a greater emphasis on self-reliance. This is not autarky, but this is the recognition that we need to have a sufficient base of capability uh, and capacity to be able to support our own immediate needs, but also to become more relevant uh, in diversifying and expanding the technological and industrial capabilities of key partners and allies first and foremost the United States, but not just the United States. Workforce, I think, remains our single biggest challenge. Uh, and I think the competition for that increasingly sought after suite of skills that are vital for the high-end capabilities, the high-tech capabilities that will, in the future, generate that asymmetry, that capability edge, this is going to be a massive challenge uh, for us. And I think in the broader Australian education system, there is a need to reconsider how we build that sense of longevity, of purpose, uh, in order to generate that pull through uh, and create that pool of capability and resource. And the other thing I think is being specific and clear in our own minds about this will involve choice. You know, we will need to be clearer in identifying where we need those capabilities and what does that require of industry? You know, we talk about sovereign industrial capability priorities, we talk about partnership with industry, and we don't just talk about it lightly. These are vital, these are sincere, and these are absolutely fundamental to generating the military capability and advantage that we've determined we need. But as I mentioned briefly in my overview, uh, I think it is also an important vector for us in building those alliances with a small a, those networks, the relationships across the region. We need to recognise that at the speed of relevance, technological change will require resetting. And I think that is, I, I just conclude by observing it's no surprise to anybody here that there is an enormous challenge to which I don't have a single answer about how, when you are dealing with multi-decadal, multi-billion dollar platforms, programs to generate platforms, how you can make those adaptive and responsive enough with all of those knock-on implications for jobs for uh, the investment that industry needs to be able to make with a degree of certainty. Uh, that is why this kind of forum, I think, is really valuable in helping shape that understanding. Uh, but I think we do really need uh, to continue with that pathway of developing the sovereign industrial capability, recognising that sovereign doesn't mean uniquely and solely and totally Australian-owned and Australia-centric. It means being able to have the command and the ability to control and influence and direct that effort to meet our requirements. Oh, thanks, Peter. <coughs> I think um, we were reminded in the panel presentations today about the themes from yesterday of uh, building relationships and cooperation between like-minded navies uh, uh, that is irrespective of, of, of national identity. Uh, I think there's one issue uh, that really brings us all together, and that's looking at how we might deal with climate change. So our first question from the floor is, could we remark on the likely or conceivable strategic impacts of climate change on the work that we do? And how might Australia respond better to the challenges of climate change? Uh, but rather than starting with Peter, I'm going to start at the other end of the table and ask Evan to lead off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th uh, thank you for that uh, very difficult question at the beginning. Um, I think what's, what's difficult, at least from a few of the Southeast Asian uh, countries' perspectives on, on climate change is, uh, first of all, there hasn't been, I think, 
uh, a consistent push across uh, major governments from the top leaders down to the lowest bureaucrat about the centrality of climate change in terms of policy making priorities, qualities, um, as well as concerns. I think it's sort of stated uh, from time to time. Uh, it's sort of programmed as part of some ministerial budget here and there. Uh, but the commitment, I think, has sort of come and gone. And I think this is where uh, uh, things are a bit tricky because they still don't really see the strategic long-term effects uh, very clearly. Uh, no one's going to lose an election over climate change in this sense. So it's not really that uh, politically significant in terms of domestic drivers in Southeast Asia. Uh, number two, when it comes to the broader long-term implications, it's certainly the case that uh, climate change will have a significant multiplying effects over existing uh, domestic and transnational uh, conflicts and tension, whether it's about food resources, whether it's about agriculture, uh, migration, um, and so forth. And I think the armed forces around the region, while traditionally uh, domestically oriented, they're not really prepared for the scale of the kinds of um, a conflict induced, uh, a climate induced insecurities uh, that might emerge, particularly when it comes to its transnational uh, dimension. So I think for the time being, as we wait for uh, a much more ready domestic governance and policy making uh, milieu, the internal, uh, sorry, the international partnerships I think could be done in somewhat um, a piecemeal fashion for the time being. For example, we can start with a better and effective marine environmental protection regime, for example, uh, uh, whether or not it's in, in disputed waters like the South China Sea um, or it's more, more clearly uh, mark a maritime space. It's still, I think, uh, a one way to go. But I feel like uh, waiting for the domestic environment to get serious and to be committed and consistent in its commitment, I think, uh, will take a while. But I think in the meantime, there should be uh, various regional uh, mechanisms we can explore uh, to prepare us uh, down the line. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Evan. Rory. Thanks. And I'll, I'll broaden it just briefly even further to include uh, really the full spectrum of environment, uh, environmental uh, risks and risks and challenges. I mean, I think that you know, we, we have to start with the acknowledgement that, um, uh, you know, navies and, and militaries uh, are not designed to combat climate change. You can't sink it, you can't shoot it, you can't deter it. Um, but the maritime, the whole maritime security establishment across all our countries has a big role to play in managing the consequences, in, in, in mitigation, in, in, in managing the impacts and supporting, supporting communities. So having said all that, I'd, I'd look at impacts, I'd look at causes, I'd look at diplomacy. I think in terms of managing the impacts, not only of climate change, but of uh, natural disasters, often accelerated by climate change, of uh, resource um, depletion, uh, pollution and so forth. I think in, in monitoring, in uh, collective regional arrangements, in information sharing, in supporting local communities, uh, I, th I think it's reasonable to build uh, uh, a role into the work of maritime and uh, of navies, but also auxiliary maritime forces uh, to, to help, particularly uh, developing countries and uh, small island states. And in that regard, I think that, um, again, it's often what we do rather than what we say uh, that's, uh, th that's important. And I think simply being a quiet, supportive presence uh, to uh, communities in both the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. And this is where, incidentally, I think the Indo-Pacific makes sense because the problems that Pacific island states and Indian Ocean island states face are pretty much precisely the same when it comes to environmental and, and resource security. And there's a lot that they can learn uh, from one another uh, in that regard as well. On the question of causes of climate change, again, that ultimately goes to the political decisions that are made uh, in every society, political, uh, business, and ultimately personal decisions as well. And there's obviously only a limited role that security establishments can, uh, can play. But finally, going to the diplomacy, I think one of the challenges we have, and certainly from an Australian context, is that we haven't done uh, our, our climate diplomacy particularly well in, in the region. There's no question of that, and that's partly because uh, of the, the impact of uh, domestic positions that our governments have taken o over a number of years. And it remains frustrating that, for example, in the Pacific, 
uh, the perception um, is there that Australia is not the, um, the ideal climate partner, even though uh, the country uh, contributing the most to uh, climate change challenges in the Pacific at present is, is China, which is ironically cloaking itself uh, in this vision of, uh, of environmental saviour. So there is uh, a challenge ahead, uh, but I think as domestic policy settings change in a country like Australia, uh, that challenge is going to get a little bit easier to navigate. Thanks, Rory. Asmin Yasmin. Right, thank you very much. Um, I guess when I hear the word strategic impact, I think about the bigger picture. But often bigger pictures actually hide where the problem starts, which is the ordinary people in small communities, countries that they're living in, and what impact does any change have on them. So when I'm talking about climate change and how I think it's likely to impact, I <clears throat> again would maybe focus on Pakistan and India, but uh, South Asia broadly, to say that when we're looking at climate change, we can't divorce that from increased urbanization in both countries and others in the region, very high population growth rates, and at the same time rising temperatures, which are combined with increased deforestation. So if you put all this together, effectively what we end up with is heat waves or in winter extreme smogs in all these countries where even simple act of breathing becomes very difficult. So I guess the impact of uh, climate change on people starting from the communities is in terms of increased death rates but also increased health impacts. Now, try being in uh, Lahore in Pakistan or in New Delhi during winter and try breathing and I think it becomes very easy to understand why it's such a huge issue at a very ground level. I think once these processes are not tackled, and in that way I understand and I think I support Rory's idea, Australian government and others have to really think very seriously about this and engage diplomatically and also support countries that need help. If it isn't done, then we would see increased uh, tendency among people to find places where they have less of this issue. And so, again, the process that I was talking about in terms of people seeking better pastures or best, better places to live in, I think climate change is going to create that push as well. So that's where I would sort of focus my answer. Next. Okay. Ewan, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, two very brief points. One, um, I, I, I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's an augmenting source of stress. Uh, and it's, going, it's not going to be an either or um, approach to climate change or traditional uh, defense challenges at state level. Climate change is going to drive and intensify interstate competition because of re resource depletion and all of the other factors that my fellow panelists have, have mentioned. So uh, I think it, uh, the traditional um, uh, purposes of defense are, are going to be uh, relevant indirectly because dry, climate change is going to drive competition uh, and unfortunately I don't see any an international solution to this appearing anytime soon. Australia is in an unfortunate position in that it has a, a large footprint as an exporter of, of fossil fuels uh, so it has to uh, understand that, that that is that it's part of the problem in that sense but I don't think a, a moratorium on export is realistic or, or the answer to that is going to have to be delivered at an international level. One thing I would say, though, is that I think um, nuclear energy is going to come back on the agenda. It already is as part of the solution to, to climate change for, for other countries, and uh, Australia may want to exercise that option in future. It will have the added benefit of uh, generating economies of scale that will help you in your, your um, ambition to build a, a nuclear-powered submarine. No political party seems willing to take that on at the moment, but I think it, it, it will inevitably rear its head one way or another. Peter. Well, look, very briefly, I, I think um, uh, what should Australia do about it? Uh, obviously, I would refer you to you know, the well-established uh, government policy position and the actions. I'd simply observe, in addition to the comments that have been made without taking issue with, with, with any of the, um, the points that have been raised that might otherwise be contestable from a, a government perspective, it's very clear that defence is, is deeply seized of and aware of uh, its role here, and that is in relation to something as simple as the stewardship we have of the estate 
uh, our own role in reducing uh, our consumption and emissions, but as Navy in particular and the ADF more broadly will be well aware and as those partner militaries of the region who very readily lent a hand to us at the height of some of our most recent disastrous uh, experiences. Uh, the bushfires and COVID have underscored that uh, the ADF uh, and Navy in particular will be uh, very much called upon uh, to respond. So I think the impacts uh, of climate change upon preparedness and upon concurrency challenges will be, uh, will be very real uh, for us as they will be for others. Uh, thanks, Peter. I'd like to direct a question to Evan noting that Evan spent 12 years working in Jakarta and uh, it, I'd like him just to comment on what he said to us in, in uh, uh, looking at how Indonesia sees Australia and the issues uh, rather than ASEAN bro more broadly. Um, well, this, it's a bit of a tricky question, I think, for Indonesia and Australia because I think uh, what's, what's ultimately kind of paradoxical about the bilateral relationship right now is that things are so good. Uh, I think it's, it's one of the strongest points in the bilateral history, economically, defense, politically. Um, things are, are very much uh, strong, but I think that gives the illusion that if things are good bilaterally, that means we will all agree on the broader strategic challenges in the region, and that's not the case. Um, I think right now, uh, this is kind of the, the, the perils of success, if you will. Precisely because things are good, we assume uh, that w I think we'll always agree on, on regional order questions about China, about climate change, and all these kinds of regional security challenges. And in some, uh, we do agree, I think, uh, uh, and there's, there's plenty of areas of convergence, uh, but in others, we do not. Um, and I think that's just the cost of doing business, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, there was a, a debate um, over AUKUS, for example, where some in Australia are questioning why is it that Indonesia was so harsh on AUKUS and Australia, but not so harsh on China and its behavior in the Natunas. And my response would be, why would you want to put Australia in the same category as China? It's a good thing that we can criticize Australia publicly and not be afraid of it because we can still talk our issues. With China, we are so concerned with domestic polarization, we tiptoe around the concerns over elites in Jakarta, that the relationship with China is becoming increasingly not transparent, uh, that everything happens behind closed doors. And that's not healthy, uh, I think, in the long run. The fact that we are now at a stage with Australia that we can air our differences publicly and work through the issues together, and we may not always agree on these major questions, particularly when it comes to China, and that's fine. But let's not assume that because things are well bilaterally that we all have to agree on major questions. There's even, uh, I know, some conversations if, let's say, there is a conflict um, and where, you know, Chinese bases in the Solomon Islands were to launch an attack, somehow Indonesia um, and Australia will be in, on the same page. And that's not always given. Um, and this is why I said earlier that Indonesia's uh, a concept speculation over anti-access and strategic autonomy still comes into play. So right now, I think the challenge for both Jakarta and Canberra is to figure out, okay, how do we keep the bilateral train going without necessarily being derailed by broader regional order questions? And I don't think we have an answer yet. I think we're sort of muddling through as, as we go along, um, but hopefully, uh, that foundation and, and, and that relationship uh, will be strong enough that even if we air our differences publicly, uh, it still means that we can work through the issues. Um, just because we disagree on China and, and a few other questions, that doesn't mean we're ready to throw away all of the good bilateral relationship that we have. Uh, thanks, Evan. For those of you that uh, uh, have not uh, looked at the figures, I know that in about 20 years' time, Indonesia and your neighbour of Australia will be about 300 million people, have an economy six times that of ours. Uh, and uh, I think to just reinforce what Evan said, it's probably a reason why we need, need to build extensive bridges between our near neighbour. Um, I've got uh, not very much time left. There's one question here I'd like to ask on behalf of the audience, and that is, uh, directed to you and Graham about uh, what he said on COVID fueling increased nationalism. 
uh, and how he responds to building better, pros better cooperation in the Indo-Pacific in light of that comment. Um, thank you for the question. I mean, I think the glass half full is that COVID has created uh, a, 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 you know, an ability to cooperate on public goods that are seen as non-threatening for platforms like the, the quadrilateral. So um, it's given something for the leaders at a political level to invest in vaccine diplomacy and, and other related COVID initiatives uh, that I think has helped bed in public support for, for the quad is not something that's just seen as a as a kind of counterbalancing or, or, or militarized um, platform. But there are, there are limits to that. And I think the distinction is the obvious one between authoritarian uh, governments and non-authoritarian governments. Authoritarian governments uh, have, uh, by and large, backed themselves into a, uh, an awkward position on, on COVID. Um, I'm not singling out China for the sake of it, but I think China does matter because um, its COVID zero policy has become uh, something that is um, very difficult for it to e exit, and it's not just about public health; it's about the uh, it's about the prestige of the of the ruling party and and um, what it's had in, invested in in a, a policy that uh, is unfortunately going to increase its isolation, uh, and that's a form of self isolation that can't be good for the region because uh, the the more barriers there are between China and uh, and its neighbouring states, the more I think it's going to drive the the um, uh, you know the uh, security dilemma and uh, and um, uh, competition, isolation, all of the, all of the negative spectrum of uh, of international behaviour. I don't think there's a there's an easy way uh, to bridge that. Unfortunately, I think what he just said is we have to work at it. Uh, look, thanks, panel, uh, and thanks to our keynote speaker. Please join me in thanking them with applause. I'd love to cart them off into a room and now have a much more deep conversation about some of the issues I've heard, heard but I'm handing over to the minders now. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, as sir just said, that wraps up uh, this session. So we're going to take a short break and I'll see you back here at 10.30. Thank you.